Center of Disease Control. Her background, uh, she has done some PhD work in biochemistry at Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, she uh, did some uh, postdoctorate work in pathology at Colorado State University and uh, studied African trypanosomiasis. Presently, she is in the division of vector-borne viral diseases at CDC uh, in the molecular biology branch. And she has worked with the molecular biology of a range of vector-borne viruses, such as St. Louis and Venezuela equine encephalitis, dengue, and uh, she's done some uh, experimental feeding work with the HIV virus. So with that, I'll uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Johnson. People are well aware that human immunodeficiency virus can be transmitted through sharing of contaminated needles by intravenous drug users. So despite assurances by public health officials that AIDS is not transmitted by blood feeding insects, such as mosquitoes, bed bugs, or biting flies, many people remain skeptical and some feel very threatened. As Rich mentioned, I work in the Division of Vector-Borne Viral Diseases in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm no longer surprised when I receive telephone calls that abruptly begin, when are you going to stop lying? I had that one once before I had my morning coffee and I wasn't sure what the subject was yet. I've also been asked, uh, have you ever heard of malaria? <laughs> People are understandably and legitimately concerned about acquiring an incurable de deadly disease by means over which they have little control. Our job to explain what is known about this issue becomes tougher as an active underground press in the community. Perhaps you've seen some of these charges. I'll read you one. The CDC and WHO have been running a relentless campaign to suppress all scientific data and evidence which tends to show that in the poverty areas of the tropics, AIDS is carried in biting insects. There is, of course, a legitimate analogy between the introduction of infected blood from contaminated needles and syringes and from arthropods. Here are the reported adult cases of AIDS by patient group. Persons for whom IV drug use is the only known risk factor constitute about 16% of patients by 1987. IV drug users here. Can you hear me in the back if I don't use the mic? I'll try to stay close to it then. If homosexuality and IV drug use by the same individual are included, the proportion reaches about one quarter, about 24%. Nevertheless, in spite of this, consensus has emerged among virologists, entomologists, epidemiologists who have studied the question that if insect transmission is occurring at all, each case would be a rare and unusual event. This quotation is from a staff report of a meeting <coughs> of last summer prepared by the Office of Technology Assessment. This consensus is reflected in the official positions of our most visible public health officers. The first, Surgeon General Everett Coop, there are no known cases of AIDS transmission by insects such as mosquitoes. And Otis Bowen, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, no person has ever been infected by an insect bite. So what I would like to do this evening is to review the scientific studies on which this consensus is based 
and help you to come to your own judgment about arthropod risk. There is a growing literature of laboratory and field studies available. I'll use the format of putting references on the slides so that those of you who wish to become better informed yourself can consult the primary literature. I'll try and describe, at least in abbreviated fashion, what scientific experiments have been done, but try not to bog down in the details so much that the principal conclusions are obscured. And for those of you who'd like more technical information, as Rick mentioned, uh, we can talk tomorrow morning. <coughs> The literature can be divided into laboratory and field studies. Laboratory studies examine both the possibility of biological transmission, and by this we mean that replication of the virus in an arthropod host is a, a necessary part of the life cycle of the virus, and it results in an amplification of the number of virus particles, and also may permit the passage of virus transovarially to the progeny of the arthropod. The other possibility is just simple mechanical transmission. That's where contaminated blood acquired by an arthropod during feeding could be transferred to another individual if the feeding is interrupted. Epidemiological studies have been conducted in the U.S., particularly in Belgrade, Florida, and also, although it's neglected from this slide, there have been a number of studies in uh, Zaire and in Uganda. So let's first look at the question of biological transmission. This, of course, is a paramount concern. If, if arthropods can actually amplify the HIV virus, we're in very in great trouble. Can HIV infect arthropod cells and be amplified? Arthropods, as you recall, are invertebrate animals with articulated bodies and limbs. And this term is broader than insects. Uh, it includes such things as ticks and mites and spiders and scorpions, uh, known to zoologists as arachnids. We'll talk about both of these uh, groups, insects and arachnids, tonight. Let me return here. A number of studies have been done to determine whether the human immunodeficiency virus can replicate in arthropod cells in culture. No one has succeeded in growing uh, the virus in culture. A number of different types of cell lines have been studied, from ticks, from moths, from fruit flies, and from a number of species of mosquitoes. Direct infection of these tissue cultures has been attempted, and so-called pool cool cultivation experiments have also been done. By this I mean that you initiate the infection in the insect cell line, and then after a period of time, you may introduce cells that are normally capable of supporting the uh, replication of HIV. And so if there's been a little bit of replication, the presence of the other uh, cells, human lymphocytes, for example, would quickly amplify that virus and render it uh, detectable. Even co-cultivation techniques have failed. There have been some indirect measures of the ability of HIV to replicate in cells. To explain this, I'll take a little digression and tell you a little bit about the HIV virus. In this micrograph, you see a T lymphocyte that is uh, heavily infected. Here is a, a budding form of virus. And at the top you see um, a mature form of the virus. In this schematic, is that adequately focused? You have a view of what is contained in the human immunodeficiency virus. It's actually quite simple. It's an RNA virus. Its genetic material is RNA and not DNA, and it belongs to a group of viruses known as retroviruses. Inside each virion is a number of copies of an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. I bring this up because most measures of the presence of HIV rely on detecting this enzyme. 
some studies rely on detecting the genome itself. On the outside of this particle, embedded in a lipid envelope, is uh, a surface glycoprotein, and it is to this protein that um, it is this information for this protein that is being uh, encoded in the various vaccines that are now under test. <coughs> Here is a schematic of the usual flow of genetic information in the cell. Up until about 1970, it was honored with the term the central dogma, that is that information flowed from DNA to RNA to protein. And it soon became apparent that that was um, overstating the case. There are plenty of examples where genetic information flows from RNA to DNA. And in the case of the AIDS virus, RNA is the principal genetic material. And a copy of this is made by the reverse transcriptase to DNA. And the DNA can become integrated into a cell that is invaded by the virus. Now let's come back to some tests to try and assess the ability of the genetic material of the AIDS virus to replicate in our by the cells. This type of experiment is called transfection. What it means is that it doesn't rely on the normal receptors on the cell to get the virus into the cell, but rather on an artificial chemical technique to introduce the genetic material into the cell. The genetic material in this case is not RNA, which is quite labile, but the DNA copy, as I showed you on the previous slide. And so this is called clone proviral DNA. It has all the genetic information that the virus has, however. We know from many different types of experiments in molecular viro uh, virology and biology that uh, cloned DNA can be expressed in uh, eukaryotic cells, that is, in, in uh, cells like ours and cells of arthropods. In experiments that determine whether the DNA could get into the cell by this kind of transfection procedure, um, the result was found to be yes. But when the enzyme that I described inside the virus was assayed for, the result was negative. And by another measure of gene expression, called in the jargon a CAT assay, uh, that was also negative. CAT stands for chloramphenicol acetyl transferase, and it all it is is a way of linking a reporter molecule to the long terminal repeats that are found at the end of the HIV genome. And it's a measure of the ability of the long terminal repeats to express themselves. And so a negative CAT assay shows that the um, promoter of transcription, the business end of the um, virus, is not active. So in summary, we have two kinds of uh, experiments, direct cultivation uh, with infectious virus and artificial introduction of genetic material into cells. And by neither means do we find that um, the genetic material can be replicated. The last experiment along this line I'll describe, we did in our laboratory to see whether whole organisms, both mosquitoes and bed bugs, could replicate the virus. Many mosquitoes are refractory to infection by different uh, so-called arthropod-borne viruses. The level at which the barrier exists is in the mid-gut at the level of the epithelium. If you bypass this barrier, all of the arthropod-borne viruses that we uh, know of will replicate readily in mosquitoes, particularly in this sort of white mouth strain of mosquitoes, which is quite large, uh, a toxoronchides mosquito. So what we did was we put virus in a little microcapillary capillary in highly concentrated form, about a million times more concentrated than would be in the blood of an AIDS patient, and injected it directly into the mosquitoes and intra-abdominally into bedbugs. The genus is called Cymex. 
we follow these uh, infected, injected uh, arthropods for a period of a month, sampling them at various times, and then we put them into culture in cells which do amplify the virus, that is human cells, and we found that even following them for a month, we found no evidence that replication was going on. <coughs> So I think the conclusions so far are quite clear cut. The possibility for biological transmission is negligible. But now let me muddy the waters. I wanted to talk about a few experiments that got Congressman's cell phones jangling about a year and a half ago that caused a great deal of alarm and in some communities I would even say hysteria about the question of mosquito uh, transmission in particular. I'll now describe experiments which were done by scientists at the Pasteur Institute who are also working in, with uh, collaborators in Zaire and in the Central African Republic. What these investigators found was that the AIDS virus can bind to cells, that it can integrate into the genome, but it is not expressed. Now, at this stage, none of those statements are contradictory to the results that I described previously. Let's go through each one of these observations one by one and see what that might mean, they might be. They were looking for a receptor on the surface of a number of cells. The normal way that HIV virus gets into a human T lymphocyte is through a receptor molecule that is known as CD4, this marker here. The cell lines stu studied do not have human lymphocyte markers on them, and that is shown in the last column where it says T cell marker, and they're all negative. The cell lines are under consideration are fruit fly, you don't know, know Drosophila, two different uh, laboratory cell lines of these fruit fly cells, two different kinds of mosquito cell lines, uh, Aedes aegypti and Culex pipiens. What the middle column shows is that if you put a fluorescent tag on the virus so you can follow it and see where it is, that anywhere from half of the cells down to about 30% of the cells about the virus. In a T lymphocyte population, where not all the lymphocytes bear the CD4 receptor, they found approximately 10% of the cells lit up with this fluorescent tag. So that suggested that there was something on the surface of insect cells that could bind the virus. Next, they had evidence that not only could it bind the virus, but that the genetic material of the AIDS virus could get into the cells and integrate into the cells. To help you to understand that, I'll tell you a little bit about how DNA is um, cut up for analysis. In this slide, you see a, a sequence of the building blocks of DNA known by their code letters G, C, A, and T. And it's a double-stranded molecule, just like all the DNA in your cells. And there are certain tools that molecular biologists have that are a bit like scissors that can cut the molecule at, uh, in predictable ways. And these tools have uh, names like echo and bam. That's irrelevant. But the point is that you can cut it in very defined fragments, and you can separate the fragments, and then you can examine the fragments for homology to anything you're interested in. In this case, we're interested in the AIDS virus. These different pieces can be sorted out a bit like you would sieve rocks in your garden. It would be a molecular sieve, however, where the different pore sizes in the sieve would either permit uh, small pieces to pass or small pieces to be retained. The kind of sieve we use is as a gel. It's a little bit like jello called polyacrylamide, and gravity is not enough to cause the separation, so we use an electric field. But the idea is basically the same, that you can sort things out by size. And if we put a sample of different 
pieces of DNA that have been cut up with these molecular scissors and run through a gel in, under the influence of an electric field, we get separation when samples first, first put on, they're all together, then they start to spread out. And near the end of the experiment, they're spread out by size. And you can get a map like what is shown on the right-hand side. All that is is a picture of where big pieces are and where little pieces are. And we can probe that to see whether any of those pieces have genetic sequences that are identical to or closely homologous to the AIDS virus. Experiments of this sort are called hybridization. You make a hybrid between the target molecule, in this case we would say DNA from mosquito cells, and a probe, which would be the AIDS virus. And the question is, does the mosquito have sequences in it that are like the AIDS virus? The French workers studied this problem both in field material that they caught in Africa and also in tissue culture cells in the lab. This slide talks about the tissue culture work. The Drosophila cells initially were negative by the hybridization test. But when AIDS virus was put into the cell culture and followed, they turned positive on day six. This is um, kind of puzzling to us because by day 10 they couldn't find it and at two months they couldn't find it. So we would say this would be transient integration of the genetic material, that it got in for a while and then it went away for reasons that aren't fully understood. Now, merely getting in is not of serious biological consequence. What you want to know is, can it express? Can it do its thing? And there are many different measures of whether it's doing its thing. There are four of them listed here. First question is, can this genetic material make any virus? Well, they didn't find any evidence of that. Answer is negative. Does it make that enzyme that's essential to the replication of the virus, the so-called reverse transcriptase? RT activity was negative. Could they find any viral RNA? No. Could they find any of the proteins that are encoded by the viral RNA? The answer is also no. So we have a tantalizing observation, the biologic and epidemiologic significance of which is, is really unclear. Now what about mosquitoes that you catch in Africa? What do they look like? Or bed bugs? Teams went out to collect uh, large pools of a variety of species. Tessie flies were examined, cockroaches, ant lions, that is, creatures that uh, feed on ants, ticks, mosquitoes, ants, flies, bed bugs, and bees. And in these two columns, I show you which species had sequences homologous to the AIDS virus and which didn't. Tetsi flies, cockroaches, ant lions, and ticks were all positive when these uh, arthropods were caught in um, Africa. When cockroaches were caught in Paris, however, they did not find homology. This is a rather peculiar list. The entomologists in the audience will quickly appreciate that these are not uh, uh, all blood feeders. It's hard to think of um, a rational explanation for why these things make the list and, and the others don't. Mosquitoes were negative in the study that was referenced in the literature citation. Since that time, there have been some unpublished but widely quoted studies with mosquitoes, where in the Central African Republic, 30% of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes caught are homologous with the HIV genome, but both males and females are positive, which uh, suggests the possibility of transovarial transmission of the sequences, since of course only female mosquitoes blood feed. The upshot of the French work is that it remains a puzzle. It's technically, um, it's viewed by many people as, as uh, technically um, uninterpretable. Some of the technical details have not been reported carefully in the literature. 
And there are some reasons to feel that they may be looking at an artifact. For example, in culture, Drosophila cells have recently been described as having their own reverse transcriptase activity. In fact, a number of insect cell lines now have been documented to have a reverse transcriptase physically distinct from the one found in HIV. So you could be looking at something that's biologically related, um, biochemically related, but quite unrelated to the question of AIDS and AIDS transmission. <coughs> okay, let's leave this series of studies for a minute and look at mechanical transmission. Mechanical transmission, you recall, is simply picking up some blood in the mouth parts of an arthropod, having feeding uh, interrupted and the arthropod finding a second host and mechanically introducing some of that uh, blood into the next individual. There's reason for concern about this with retroviruses. There is precedent for mechanical transmission of oncogenic viruses. Here's a, a list of the agents that I'm aware of that have been mechanically transmitted, either in the laboratory or documented to occur uh, in the field. Equine infectious uh, anemia virus, colloquially known, colloquially known as swamp fever. Uh, friend leukemia virus, a virus of uh, mice. Feline leukemia virus, bovine mucosis virus, and perhaps HTLV-1. The nomenclature in the AIDS field is a bit confusing. HTLV-3 was named proposed by the American workers in Gallo's lab to be the AIDS virus. Um, French workers called it LAV, and an international committee settled on HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, to sort of solve the like, political problems. Gallo's lab had earlier described a human uh, T lymphotropic virus that caused T cell leukemia, and that's what I mean by HTLV1. These viruses have a high viridian, a lot of particles of virus in the blood. In the case of bovine leukosis virus, it's cell associated, there's not much free virus. But it causes uh, a lymphocytosis, that is a pro proliferation of lymphocytes. So the actual number of um, infectious cells goes, so the number of infectious cells is um, substantial. This factor, this issue of viremia and the level of infected cells becomes crucial when you think about the problem of AIDS transmission because what you're interested in is whether the volume of blood on the mouth parts of a potential vector is sufficient to transmit one infectious dose of virus. And one factor in that consideration will be the level of virus in the blood to begin with. One of the, the best uh, indications of what may go on in man is from the data on healthcare workers. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of experiments with uh, unintended experiments with the introduction of HIV infected blood into people accidentally. Now, CDC has documented and followed about 1,200 cases of accidental exposure in a healthcare setting. The relief is that. There's only about a 0.3% chance of developing AIDS antibody following exposure by a needle stick to AIDS-infected blood. At the time this slide was done, um, in June of last year, 649 people had exposure to blood, 172 to other body fluids, for a total of more than 800 people. And out of the, all those, accidents, only four people developed antibody. That doesn't mean they have clinical AIDS, but they developed antibody. Since that time, people have simulated needle sticks to try to have a better feel of what volume of blood could have potentially been introduced into these people. And as you can well imagine, it's probably a whole range of things. Sometimes you might have a deep puncture wound, sometimes you might have a very superficial injury. But if you model a needle stick by 
sticking a, a needle through a membrane and using radioisotopic tracers to figure out what the mean volume is, you come up with about one micrometer. Many times more than the volume on the mouth parts of either a mosquito or a bed bug. A bed bug has about 70 nanometers. A mosquito, um, tenfold less. And the amount that can actually be delivered into a blood vessel is estimated to be between 0.2 and 0.7 nanometers. Nanometer is one one thousandth of a microliter. So you can see that we're going down several orders of magnitude in volume here. Take home message. AIDS is difficult, or seroconversion, much less AIDS, is difficult to achieve even with direct introduction of volumes of blood hundreds, of, hundreds if not thousands of times greater than the volume on the mouth parts of uh, arthropods. There is still, though, a theoretical basis for being concerned about mechanical transmission. I'll describe some work we've done and summarize some work out of South Africa by Peter Yuck and his colleagues, and some work with mosquitoes at the NIH and Bethesda, Maryland. The virus can survive both in aesogypti mosquitoes and in cymex bed bugs for significant lengths of time. In Gallo's laboratory, when the mosquitoes were fed blood that had highly concentrated HIV in it. The HIV was detectable 48 hours after feeding. In the case of Yup's work, they were unable to detect it in mosquitoes, but were able to find it in bed bugs. Let me show you the results here. In their work, they're looking at the enzyme activity, reverse transcriptase, and they follow it in culture to amplify the signal with time. The bugs, the bed bugs, developed good reverse transcriptase activity. Here is shown the ratio between an uninfected culture and an infected one, and they got a signal to noise ratio of more than 120 eventually after a month of cultivation. With mosquitoes, they never got a signal above background. We've also looked at this uh, problem. And I'd like to tell you a little bit technically how, how it's done. Obviously, we cannot take mosquitoes and feed them on people. And AIDS is a disease of people. Mice don't get AIDS, dogs don't get AIDS. Cats get their own kind of AIDS, but it's quite different. So we can't do the real, we can't do, certainly ethically, we cannot do the experiment that would definitively answer the question. So we have to approach it indirectly. To do that, we take blood that we, to which we add concentrated AIDS virus, which we've grown in tissue culture and concentrated in a centrifuge. And we've made an artificial animal, basically. We put the blood in the chamber and we put a water jacket around it to bring it up to body temperature. And we put a skin over the top, which is a mouse skin. Uh, no graduate students volunteered. And put a, uh, this chamber in a biosafety containment uh, hood, and then put uh, bed bugs on the surface and let them feed. After they had engorged, we would hold them for various periods of time and then grind them up and put their contents in tissue culture to, to let the virus was there, it could grow up to a higher level so we could see it easier. And the whole point of this is just to do what you might call a decay curve. Um, how far can you find it? How long does it last? We're doing a very artificial thing in that we're giving it so much virus. We're intentionally doing that. If we get a negative result, we have a lot of confidence that it's truly negative in nature because we're stacking everything in favor of detection. When we do this, I promise you this is the only slide for which you need binoculars. Uh, I'll talk through it don't worry too much about the details. What, what is depicted is a summary of when we found the virus and when we didn't. The first line is to show you that we had no evidence of biological replication. We followed it out for uh, four weeks, and those 
numbers of one mean that we didn't get anything over baseline. That's a signal to noise level of one. In other words, we didn't get anything. Then we wanted to look at the early time period after feeding, how long did the virus last? And we found uh, consistently high results from zero time all the way out to three days. So that's ample time for a bed bug who's had its meal interrupted to go find another host. And so theoretically, if the bug's hot, it, it could um, it, it could have the potential for transmitting the virus. Then we looked at the um, time period a little bit later to see when it petered out. And three days is about when it starts to peter out. We had, uh, sometimes we detected it on day four and sometimes we didn't. The longest we detected it was out in day eight. So, in the laboratory simulations, we found that it persists. Then we wanted to try and see whether we could mimic an interrupted feeding. Mosquito bites an aid patient, doesn't finish his meal, go find somebody else, bites them. So we would interrupt the feeding, in this case with bed bugs, uh, and let them finish their meal on a separate chamber, and as a separate sort of artificial animal. And we would do this in batches of 50 because we wanted to stack things again in favor of detection. And we were never able to detect any virus in the second chamber. But the volume of blood left on the mouth parts and introduced into the second chamber during completion of the meal was insufficient to lead to a detection of virus when it was uh, put into tissue culture. So what does a negative result mean? Uh, it gives you some boundaries on the uh, probability of the event. It does not permit you, of course, to say that something can never happen but I believe that it's exceedingly rare if it occurs at all. We also looked in the feces of the uh, bed bugs and were never able to recover any virus from the feces. This, of course, is a means of transmission of Chagas disease by uh, kiss, so-called kissing bug, bugs in South America. There is precedent for this kind of transmission of human disease. Now I'll try and uh, pick up the pace here, realize it's getting late, and talk about some field studies, studies with people. Bell Glade was the area that got everybody's attention about uh, the possibility for insect transmission a couple of years ago, 1985. And the reason for all the concern is that in this relatively small town of about 16 or 17,000 people, uh, west of West Palm Beach, there were 93 cases of AIDS. That converts to an incidence of 564 per 100,000, or rates equal to parts of New York City and New Jersey. That's a, a, a very um, high incidence of AIDS. Of those 93 cases, seven were cases with no identified risk factors, 8% of the population. Nationally, we have a, about 3% of people with unidentified risk factors. People that are lost follow up, um, who do not uh, interview, um, say that they have engaged in, in any of the activities that are known to be risk factors. So the question came up, what's the role of environmental factors? Could mosquitoes be transmitting here? A rather elaborate study was conducted with both uh, randomized selected participants, people in uh, sexually transmitted disease clinics, and people who were sele self-selected because they wanted to know their HIV antibody status. And all about 1,000 people were studied out of this community of 16,500. And in summary, all the epidemiological measures of insect exposure, that is all sorts of things like whether you've been bitten by mosquitoes in your house, whether they're lice in the house, or house, or itch mites in the house, or fleas in the house, or bed bugs in the house, whether you work outdoors, you don't use insect repellents, as you can see, a substantial list. None of these things were correlated with zero positivity antibodies to the AIDS virus. There were also some laboratory measures of mosquito exposure in uh, this population. 
In South Florida, a number of mosquito-borne viruses do circulate. They have names such as Tensaw, Mockery, Dengue 2, Sickles, Encephalitis, Keystone virus. And you can test people's serum for antibodies to these and get an idea of what their exposure to mosquito bites is. And there was no correlation with antibodies to these viruses and the presence of AIDS. The upshot of it was that the risk factors for AIDS and Bellable AIDS are the same risk factors that have been described elsewhere. Largely um, sexually associated transmission in women being positive for um, syphilis tests gave you an adjusted odds ratio of almost 11 fold over people who are not positive for this test. So there, when all is said and done, there were no surprises in the results of this study. Here gives you a, a breakdown of AIDS, AIDS cases in the U.S. by age. You can see that 0% of people between 13 and 19 are represented in this uh, case listing. People less than 13 usually show AIDS uh, in the first two years of life that is acquired perinatally. In that Bellblade population, children between the ages of 2 and 14 uh, were totally um, devoid of antibody to HIV, as were people older than 60. So the age distribution is not what you'd suspect for an arthropod-born disease, although for the entomologists here, I remind you that there are arthropod-born diseases where there are certain age uh, uh, distributions that um, that go against this. Dengue 2, for example, often affects children between three months of age and one year of age. And uh, St. Louis encephalitis uh, differentially affects older people. So the age distribution, while it's argued strongly in this paper, is not um, a totally convincing um, argument to rule out in insect uh, transmission. Overall in the U.S., 5 to 15-year-olds are 16% of the population, but they only have two-tenths of a percent of uh, AIDS cases. And the risk factors in this age group have been established for all but one individual. This person was lost to follow-up. So there doesn't appear to be anything going on here that uh, is not understood. I'll finish up with two brief studies that were conducted in Zaire. Although in the U.S. seroprevalence is low among pediatric age, the pediatric age group, in Zaire it's high. This slide should say 2 to 14 year olds instead of 2 to 4. In Mami Yama Hospital in Kinshasa, Zaire, 11% of all the kids coming in were HIV seropositive. It's a really startling, shocking number. And so the question was, uh, why? Is the situation very much different there? Is AIDS being transmitted, for example, by insects in Africa when it's not in the U.S.? And studies showed that this high seroprevalence was associated with transfusions and medical injections. Many kids report with malaria, they're anemic, they receive a transfusion. Sickle cell cases are transfused, and the resources of the poor country of Zaire are insufficient to provide um, antibody screening of blood donors. And when the WHO team looked at the blood they were using in their hospitals, uh, close to 7% of it was contaminated with AIDS antibody. So the hospitals are active in transmitting infections in this situation. There was a household contact study also in a large population of uh, AIDS patients in Zaire. And household contact does not increase HIV seropositivity. It supports what's been studied extensively in the US and in Europe, that merely living in a household with an AIDS patient, with patients does not increase your risk. And so horizontal transmission is rare if it occurs at all. In closing, I'd like to say that in the 
absence of, of absolute proof, you have to govern your personal behavior pretty much by your gut instincts. And it's my opinion that while I might consider canceling outdoor, outdoor barbecue because of the threat of lightning, I would never consider canceling one from the threat of AIDS. And I'd like to put this whole question of insect transmission in the larger context of what we do know about the means of AIDS transmission. The routes of transmission are quite clear. They're sexual, homosexual between men and heterosexual from men to women and women to men. Exposure to blood is a risk, whether you're a drug user or whether uh, transfusion, uh, you receive transfused uh, products, especially prior to the routine screening for antibody, or if you're exposed to occupational uh, needles, risk of needle stick injury. AIDS can be acquired perinatally, either before birth or after. We are faced with a problem of monumental proportions, a real national tragedy. The estimates are that between a million and a million and a half Americans are infected. CDC has been revising downward its estimate of HIV infection more towards the million side, but it's still a very substantial number. Five years after follow-up,